Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another NHT Discovery Education webinar, for the current advice for the current times, with myself, Andrew Hammond, and our brilliant guest, who of course we know and respect so much, Guy Dudley, head of advice, head of running the, the advice team at the NHT. And as you know, on a lot of these regular ones, we're always looking at uh, hopefully what's on your mind at the moment. I myself, I'm still in headship, very much so. It's been a busy day, as I'm sure it has been for you. Um, if you want to join in the conversation during this, then please do. Uh, you can always uh, uh, join us on social media. Uh, we tend to use hashtag the whole teacher. Uh, but of course, please feel, feel free to share your comments and questions during this webinar itself using the chat button and uh, raising your hand and so forth. Uh, keep an eye on the Q&A button, as always, because we do like this to be a two-way street, a dialogue. We do love your, uh, your questions and comments and things. We're all doing uh, very similar jobs, I'm sure. So uh, let's share what we think. Um, I'm just going to uh, go on to the next slide so you know who we are, of course. Um, we've got an agenda. So it just remains really for me to, first of all, welcome Guy. Good to see you again, Guy. Hi, Andrew. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm surviving. Thank you. We're getting there. Looking forward to Christmas. Been, uh, yeah. been a tough time. A lot, of, uh, a lot of staff absence at the moment, which people on the call will know about. But we're getting there. Well, November <laughs> and... Um... You know, 10 years at the NHT have taught me that November, March and June are critical months because they're the only months of the year that aren't interrupted by anything. And there's no bank holidays, there's no school terms That's or true. half term. Yeah, yeah. So That's November true. is a is a tough month. Yeah. Uh, it's dark and cold and miserable. Um, very but true. I can bring a bit of joy to people. We on, certainly can. Uh, we always do that. Thursday afternoon. We certainly can. So um, so you've got an agenda today. Do you want to talk us through it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, staff conduct is, you know, one of the things that is tricky. Uh, you know, it's difficult. Yep, it Head teachers rarely get, and, and school leaders rarely get formal training for it. Yep. Um, it's difficult to do. It's tricky. It's time consuming. Um, and so I wanted to tackle it head on uh, and then say, you know, what are the strategies? What's in your toolkit yeah. uh, as a school leader for managing staff conduct? Uh, and also share a couple of tools that people might be a little unfamiliar with, uh, or they might be familiar with them, but aren't entirely confident when and how to use them. Um, so we're going to be talking about the management standard setting letter. Um, people might know that as management advice letter. It's, it goes by a, a variety of titles. But often people, and in my experience, talking to many members over the years, um, they've heard of it. They're a little unconfident about when to use it. Yep. They know what it is, yep. uh, but they're just a little unconfident about when they should invoke it, when they should apply it. And then there's little really helpful conduct matrix that I'd like to share with people um, that, again, you know, is, is a really helpful aid memoir. Uh, to dealing with any matters relating to staff conduct, really. So I'm hoping but that by the end of this session, people will feel more confident, um, more ready to take action, yeah. uh, and just generally feel that they're, they're, they're more equipped uh, to deal with these matters when they arrive uh, arise, because they're, they're tricky. Yeah, they are they're tricky. tricky. They are tricky. And they involve difficult conversations sometimes, but um, we'll get they into are. that. Sure. Um, Brilliant. So we have got some slides to go through, yeah. uh, and I'm yeah. sure um, by our colleague Bobby that uh, everyone will get a copy of these slides uh, yeah. within the next sort of 24 hours or so. Sure. Um, but I wanted to make some opening remarks because, like all topics, you can't just dive in. Um, I really wanted to cover a few things off that might be helpful to set as context, Andrew. Yeah. So there's a document called the STPCD, uh, the School Teachers Pay and Conditions document. It actually is not a bad document to read. Um, there's the link for it there in the in the presentation that you'll get. So if you've never read it, looked at it, seen it, you can go on there and the link will work. It's 80 pages long, but my advice is don't read it all in one go. Yep. Um, but it is actually quite a well written document and it pretty much sets out the employment framework for school leaders and for teachers and support yep. staff. 
Yeah. Uh, if there's one document you, you really ought to be familiar with, Absolutely. it's this one. Uh, and if there's one section you really ought to be familiar with, it's section seven. Yeah. Because section seven is all about how we do stuff in schools. And I thought it might be helpful just to sort of start off with the boring bit, really, uh, which is that actually Section 7, uh, and, and try not and sort of, you know, uh, smirk when I say this, but it, it actually makes it a requirement of school leaders to manage performance and to promote harmonious working relationships. Uh, the, the, that's easier said than done. Yeah. Um, but, you know, many school leaders don't know it's actually a requirement of them uh, to do that. So by doing this, the stuff that we're going to be talking about this afternoon, you're actually fulfilling your professional responsibilities and duties. Wow. Um, and you'll be seen, more importantly, uh, to be doing so. Um, because I think we've touched on this before, haven't we, where, you know, Pete, as a school leader, you're the most visible person in the school or should be. And people are developing a narrative about you. People are developing a, a story that they hold in their mind about you and about how you conduct yourself as a school leader and how you manage situations and people. Um, and they're building that narrative uh, and using it uh, as the basis for future, future interactions with you. Um, so it's really important that you not only do this stuff, you do it well and you're seem to be doing it um in in not such a contrived way um, well put. yeah it's true so those are just a, a few opening remarks just to sort of you know set the hairs running and and now we're sort of we're, we're bringing everyone back down we're off. Uh, yeah to earth so i just wanted also to touch on why it's so important to get it right um, it is difficult because it involves making judgments about people and how they conduct themselves. And those judgments alone are quite subjective in their nature because we have built in biases uh, that if we're not careful um, can uh, can come out and, and bite us uh, when we're not uh, familiar with it. But And I think this goes for children as well, the pupils. Andrew, when we've got standards, when we've got boundaries, people feel safe. Uh, it's one of the basic laws, isn't it, of, of humanity. I think with boundaries, I think standards, people feel safe and secure. And when they're safe and secure, when they feel safe and secure, they're more likely to be effective uh, and they're more likely to be their authentic selves. Yeah. Um, for the school leader, having those standards, those boundaries, gives them the mandate to manage uh, because you are responsible for upholding those standards of performance, uh, those boundaries. Um, and I don't use those in a in a negative way. Those boundaries can, can equally amount to praise uh, as well as sanctions. Because mm. uh, I think it's really important that we don't we don't treat this session as something that is just about managing poor performance or bad performance. It's about managing the total teacher, a whole performance. And I think finally, the last part I'd made about this is, is you know, I, I, I know in previous webinars, you and I have touched upon culture and that sort of intangibility of culture. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think some of the, some of the best definitions I've heard of culture are, it's how we get stuff done around here. Isn't it's it? how we do things. It's how we operate. That's right. And I, and I think standards of conduct are, are a prerequisite for that. Um, once you've got that in place, you're you're halfway there, really. Um, and I think again, looking at the whole teacher and the whole pupil, uh, when pupils uh, pupils will look to staff to set those standards. They'll look to the adults around them. Uh, to set those standards for how they should be conducting themselves around school and beyond school, uh, whether it's whether they're going to secondary school, college, university, or, or entering the world of work. Those early standards, those early boundaries are set generally 
in school and at home. Of course, um, I've always found where where in in all the schools I've worked in over the years that um, uh, if you've got a positive culture, a collaborative culture, um, not a culture of fear or competition, but a culture of, of you know proper cooperation, um, it's it's really run on goodwill actually. Yeah. Yeah. And the moment you start losing some of that goodwill is where you perhaps have to start reminding people of the standards. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but ideally, absolutely. with goodwill flowing, you don't need to. But, yeah. but perhaps it's worth establishing it at the beginning. But ideally, it's very powerful. Goodwill. Yeah, yeah. Great. So um, that's. I hope there's some compelling reasons there. Yeah. Um, why it's important to get it right. And uh, apologies for the mother and apple pie, but um, they are very much sort of homespun truths. And I think things that we'd all recognize um but that's sometimes yeah. too busy to pay attention pay, pay as much attention as we should do to them i love the idea that you said that when people feel safe and it's the same for both for students and staff isn't it when they feel mm. safe and secure they're more able to be their authentic effective selves yes yeah. so true isn't it it's, it's massive uh, day. right back to my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> back to the it is, well, it's, it's so true isn't it it's yeah. so true when we feel safe we yeah. we generally you know want to, to to be the best of ourselves that we can be. Yeah, we do. And when we don't feel safe, we're we're on the back foot. Yeah, we are. We're, um, we're, we're not on the front yeah. foot. No. Um, yeah. Always better to be on the front foot as a trade unionist. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> thanks. Um, last sort of introductory slide, really. Um, you know. I think it's it's important that everyone in this call recognises, and, and I'm sure they do want to be judged as fair and reasonable, someone who's supportive and collegiate and tough when you need to be. Um, the trouble is dealing with conduct and poor conduct can feel very adversarial, um, but you need to be equipped with the tools to enable you to approach these issues with reasonableness um but also to be tough uh when circumstances um determine and determine it um i think we've got a question andrew have we uh, have we got a question yeah i was just trying to uh keep an eye on that i'm sorry um, that's okay mm -hmm. right let's have a look i'm uh struggling to the menu here not under the Q&A, I haven't, but possibly in the chat, which I'm just looking. Um, we have a question saying, have you tried this yet? Automatically records any meeting and takes notes with AI. That's an advert for Zoom of some description, I think. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so perhaps not a question one, pertaining to... One of our technical team, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. So should we press on? Yeah, and I'll absolutely. Keep my eye out there as well. Yeah. So again, just a reminder of what's already in your toolkit uh, as a school leader. Yeah. Um, of course, there are the professional standards. Yeah. And we're all familiar with them. There are professional standards for head teachers. They're non-statutory. Um, they're there very much to help governing bodies inform. Uh, the performance management arrangements yeah. of school leaders. That's all they're there for, as a backdrop, uh, if you like. They are statutory for teachers. So anyone who's a qualified teacher, uh, QTS, part-time, full-time, um, they are uh, statutorily held responsible for performing against those standards. Yeah. And then there are teaching standard, teaching standards for teaching assistants and higher level teaching assistants. Again, both of those sets are non-statutory. They're very much there to help inform the performance management, uh, if I use that term broadly, uh, of those groups of, of your staff. Um, and these are all within the Pathway Hub. Um, so whether you're a member of Pathway, a subscriber, or whether you're a member of the NHT, all of these are available with the NHT's commentary around them uh, at the touch of a button. There's the staff to, code of conduct. Do you want to show any of those, uh, Guy, or later? Yeah, 
that perhaps why not um because uh, you know i've posed the sort of rhetorical question does your school have one and i'm i'm often surprised how many schools say we don't have a staff code of conduct um it's just oh, yeah there you go do you want the model um, policy or the uh, that's one, the model policy yeah um so you know we've done the hard work for you well i've done the hard work for you um i've actually written a, a model policy um on staff code of conduct um and the bits in yellow are the bits you can change and shift for your school um and there's some standards brilliant. uh for them um and there's some more standards for them um <laughs> they're very much it's a very straightforward document i think all schools should have a code of conduct this goes beyond the professional standards and just sets the scene uh, for people uh, coming into your school, especially helpful for new starters uh, and induction uh, for new teachers. I think that's terrific. Um, so, yeah, there's a staff code of conduct. Uh, I think every school should have one. Absolutely. Um, and there's one there for you uh, if you want it. Brilliant. We also have um the disciplinary policy um for all uh i can't actually see the presentation andrew but um uh if there's a chart there you go um fantastic i was doing that from memory so we all <laughs> we have the disciplinary policy which again you know is is really something for, as a last resort um yep. it's there it's there yep. for a reason um but i think if if uh, people ought to think of it as the tool that you reach for last um you also want to consider uh, alongside disciplinary and we'll we'll get to this um whether or not uh, you need to suspend uh, or alter alternative uh, courses of remedial action sometimes when you're thinking of uh handling a particularly tricky situation but you don't really want to go down the suspension route um there are other alternative courses to that um so putting someone on garden leave yeah uh work asking someone to work from home if that's at all possible of course some people can't uh or redeployment to an alternative role yeah. um suspension again should be the last act that you consider when all else has failed um and i've just put there a couple of reasons why you might want to suspend um whether there's a risk to the integrity uh to the evidence that you may be looking at as part of an investigation or the self uh, safety and welfare of staff mm. or where the evidence suggests that a dismissal may be likely yeah. So those are the sort of grounds upon which you should be thinking around whether or not to suspend somebody pending an investigation. Um, so you've already got quite a few tools in the in in your kit kit bag, if you were. Yeah. Three approaches: very simple, very straightforward. The informal approach: a word to the wise. Um, and I would only suggest this for what I'd call low-level noise. So. By that, I've defined that as being late for work, rolling one's eyes at a meeting. How many meetings have we all been to where you can see someone rolling their eyes um, or challenging you as a school leader uh, in front of others? Um, but these are low level. Uh, these aren't crimes of the century, but these are low level things. And unless they go checked, um, they're more likely to become the norm um remember the three f's one of the most uh, useful things to remember as as any leader really friendly firm and fair in all your approaches how do i you know those are three things that you can check out is this approach that i i'm proposing to take friendly is it firm mm -hmm. is it fair mm -hmm. um don't duck the issue if someone rolls the eyes at a meeting, um, ask to see them afterwards. Uh, it sends a clear message to everybody in the meeting who's leaving the room that something has been done, some behavior has been exhibited 
which isn't entirely acceptable. Yeah. Um, tell them why you've asked them, uh, why you're, you, you've, uh, you're seeing them, and give them that example. Always provide examples wherever possible yeah. uh, with this low level approach. Um, ask them why they're feeling so strongly, because they clearly are, and why they're exhibiting this conduct. Um, keep an open mind. Um, they may have a perfectly legitimate uh, objection to what you're proposing. And it may be helpful feedback for you, but it's the way they've done it that's not right. It's not acceptable. Um, remind them of their expectations. And one of the things that I've always impressed upon school leaders, Andrew, is even when you have that word to the wise, follow it up with an email. Yeah, um, absolutely set an auditable trail um emails carry quite a bit of weight as we know uh and i think ultimately it sort of suggests that this school leader hasn't just had the word and disappeared down the corridor they've gone back to their office they've sent off a couple of lines firm and friendly and fair um to remind that person that they've had that conversation absolutely um absolutely. Yeah, i think it's good advice right. Yeah, yeah. It's another thing to do in a busy school leader's day. Um, but I still think it's the right thing to do. Uh, and it needn't be long or complicated. A couple of lines, maximum, job done. Absolutely. Brilliant. Then um, we've got what I call the tactical approach, which we'll, we'll expand upon. Um, most issues of misconduct fall into this category in a school um and you'd want to use this approach where either an informal approach hasn't worked uh, or isn't leading to the improvements or something's a little more serious than the sort of low level noise um at the nht we call it the management standard setting letter and some of you in your school leadership roles may be familiar with this uh, others might use it regularly others have some school leaders i've spent over the years have never heard of it uh, it's a perfectly legitimate route to take and i've given you some examples there uh, of perhaps when you might want to use this approach yeah. um, so the persistent minor misconduct um, when professional boundaries are blurred and there's a quite a common example uh, there. Uh, publicly undermining the practices of the school um, or making inappropriate comments to staff. That could be on social media uh, as well. Um, and effectively stirring it in the staff room or stirring it amongst uh, other members of staff uh, that leads to that sort of peer pressure that Frankly, most of the time is completely unwanted by others. They just want to get on with their jobs. Um, so there's some examples of when you might use this approach. I found this approach to be incredibly effective. Um, and I'll, I think the next slide sort of hopefully pushes that message home. So let's look at its features and benefits. Um, it you know, number one, it dodges the formal approach, um, and there's sometimes that's a, a good thing to do, Andrew. You know, I'm sure you've been involved over the years uh, as a school leader in having to have these formal procedures and. running, and I'm sure most people on the call will have as well. Yeah. They're long, they're hugely time consuming, uh, they're quite stressful. Yeah. Um, and this avoids it. It sets very clear expectations of behaviour. Um, it's kept on the members' file. It has many of the features of the formal procedure in that it carries a time period during which improvement is set uh, and is expected to be achieved. It sends a very clear message to the perpetrator, the culprit, that this matter's gone beyond the informal mm -hmm. um, and that they're taking one step towards the more formal approach, perhaps. Yeah. 
it does provide a narrative um, for ongoing dialogue. And it is a proven way. And I, I've, I've used a, word, a phrase that I quite like. It's, it's a proven way to reconcile and match conduct to standards. Yeah. We're not looking for a precise fit. You know, we're humans living in a, the real world. Um, but teaching is a profession. And I often have to remind some colleagues of that, that it's, it's a profession. And what marks it out as a profession is that it has a set of professional standards, like medicine and accountancy um, and veterinary. So, you know, there's a set of, there's a code of professional standards. And that's what makes it a profession. Absolutely. Um, and your job as a school leader is to make sure that people fulfill those responsibilities. Uh, under those standards absolutely so <clears throat> i think if we look at the next slide we'll go back and have a look at an example of a management standard setting there because i think it'd be really helpful for for viewers listeners to actually see what one looks like yeah. um, very simple very straightforward formal procedure is the disciplinary procedure we all know it whether we've been on either side of the table in, in our long and illustrious careers, we all know what it means. Yeah. Um, it's, boy, I'm in trouble here. Um, there's going to be a long, resource-consuming procedure. Um, and when I tell people that it is likely to last a whole school term, by the time you've done an investigation, yeah. had the hearing, had an appeal, yeah. um, it's likely to take the whole school term. Um, and really, it's something you want to avoid, which is why trying to get the informal approach and the tactical approach right are so important. Okay. Yeah. It really ends well as well. Um, really. One of the reasons it doesn't end well and I'm sure every single school leader has been on the, uh, you know, the, the end of this, is that when you decide to press that nuclear button, <laughs> the, the disciplinary procedure button, the member of staff will nearly always go sick. Um, so you're in a situation there <laughs> where you have to freeze one procedure and switch to another. Absolutely. And that other is likely to take weeks to resolve as well um typical outcomes we know are time limited warnings dismissal uh, and possible referral to the tra um less commonly and people don't recognize that you know some of these uh outcomes are a possibility a legitimate possibility you get what's called action short of a dismissal so it is perfectly possible to offer someone demotion, uh, transfer to an alternative role or training, potentially all three uh, or any of the above or below. And just to be, just for completeness, Andrew, I'd, I'd like to underline the fact that some people may resign yeah. as a result of uh, the school leader pressing that disciplinary button. Mm -hmm. um it's entirely up to the school and i would always take advice from your hr oh. advisors but you can continue with the procedure uh whilst that member of staff is serving their notice um and the notice period is likely to be well as we know anything up to a term uh so you can actually press on with the procedure um so resigning is not something that they can do to avoid uh, the full force of the disciplinary procedure. And in very sensitive cases, say safeguarding, it may be that the school has advice from the LADO, for example, that they will continue with this because they need to take it to a point where they may have to refer it to the teacher's regulation authority. Um, of course, if they resign, they could always, until it's completed, go on to another teaching job. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and therefore, you'd, you'd, you'd have to declare mm. as the referee uh, yeah. for that person 
that you had instigated disciplinary proceedings but had not completed them um so you can see where one one of these issues in hr start to uh, drift into another such as providing a reference absolutely um absolutely well there are sometimes when this you know this formal approach has to uh, be invoked um because only certain types of extreme behavior will invoke this approach no other approach is appropriate for it really yeah. um but it's one that you want to try and avoid and the best way of avoiding it is getting the other two right uh, the informal and the tactical approach so true so i think true. on the next slide we've got the yeah so this is this is a something really good to actually print off keep in your desk somewhere perhaps not put it on the wall um <laughs> Unless you see that as uh, something to be admired, <laughs> uh, but but actually, <coughs> just a nice little what, what the NHT have produced called a conduct matrix. So if in doubt, and these matters often leave school leaders in doubt, quite rightly, mm. you can look at this, uh, and just sort of this will help you uh, try and determine the best approach and the best way forward um so you can see that we've got the three approaches informal tactical and formal along the top uh and the resources effectively uh that you will need on the left mm -hmm. uh, and the possible outcomes um and the one that we'll look at in a moment is the management standard set of let the st uh, standard setting letter so you can see that's under documentation on the horizontal axis because it actually is a very simple document to produce um and you'll see that it's a tactical intervention approach um and you'll see that um you know there will be uh, the right approach for you to take in any circumstance uh, it's just a nice helpful uh, little aid memoir if you like uh, for school leaders we've had a quick uh, just a quick question from carrie uh, uh, who unfortunately missed the beginning of the presentation will we send a, a copy of these slides yes we will won't we guy we absolutely will we absolutely will very good and all the links in it carrie will work so uh and you won't have missed it because effectively i'm i'm talking through uh giving a commentary on the slides um there are always risks aren't there uh to everything we do in life and um managing conduct is is not immune mm. uh, five reasons why you can fairly dismiss someone in the uk just a reminder uh capability uh conduct redundancy breaking the law uh and some other substantial reason which is a wonderful one and perhaps one day we might do a um a whole session on that um but it's the bit at the end that i'd like to draw everyone's attention to which is the, the the sort of risk factor um if an employee chooses to uh raise submit an employment tribunal claim against the employer it's never against an individual it's always against the employer um the panel on the tribunal will use the ACAS code of practice as the standard bearer to determine whether a dismissal has been fair um, and obviously if a dismissal has not been fair because either there's an unfair outcome or the procedure has been run unfairly uh, the employee will win and be awarded uh, an eye-watering sum of money um, if the dismissal has been fair, uh, the, the panel will um, find in the employer's favour and the case will be dismissed. Um, I've put the ACAS code of practice there because your disciplinary policy should be based on it. Um, might be helpful for you to check, the, check out that it is with your service provider. Um, that little sentence right at the very end of that slide is critical, but I want it's not terribly relevant in some respects, but it is relevant in others. 
if a member of your staff leaves your school uh, under a bit of a cloud, um, they have three months less a day to bring a claim to the tribunal. Um, and it's really important that it's three months less a day. There is no give on that at all. So let's take today, the 24th of November. Three months from today would be the 24th of February, if I've got my maths correct. Um, but actually, that would be a day too late. It would be the 23rd of February. So you have to sort of rewind a day, because otherwise, if you counted the 24th of February, you'd be counting the 24th twice. Um, and actually, um, that would be actually three months and a day. Um, so, um, so you're on mute, Andrew. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's really important to make sure that you've got that uh, squared away. And by all means, one of the actions you could take away is, is to ensure that you your ACAT, that your policies in particular, uh, the disciplinary policy that deals with conduct is consistent with the ACAS code of practice. Absolutely. And if it's not, make sure it is. Ask your HR provider to um, effectively review it immediately uh, and make sure that it is in line with the ACAS code of practice. Okay. Um, that's all on that one. Yeah. The, as you might imagine, the advice hub, Pathways Advice Hub, has got an awful lot of information on it. And we're, we're going to dive into one of those in a moment. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I was looking at it the other day, Andrew, it's got 114 individual advice pieces on human resources issues alone. Alone. And that's one of 12 tiles. 12 categories <laughs> absolutely 12 categories uh hr is the most popular one it's the one that people <laughs> have the most difficulty and probably spend the most of their time i spend all my time <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah. just relating to conduct alone yeah there are i don't know how many three six and there are nine different um pieces separate distinct piece of advice related to the management of conduct alone and i think one of the ones that we're just going to dip in and you'll see them there the standards the, the policies the conduct mm -hmm. we're just going to dip into one yeah um it's called uh the management standard letter because i wouldn't mind showing you uh an example yeah um of a, a management standard setting letter um uh, you know we've spent a lot of a lot of time over this last half an hour three quarters of an hour telling you about it um <clears throat> so let's show you an example of one so these are all the wonderful piece of advice i think it's about halfway down although you won't know where halfway is because you're <laughs> you can't see the bottom uh, <laughs> could be a bit further see all these wonderful documents that you're missing if you're not a member of pathway there it is um it's staff conduct is the one below that andrew that's it so we've actually got a separate piece here mm -hmm. on the, the management standard setting letter uh, and it's written by me uh, and a colleague. I always work with a colleague when I work uh, on these pieces of paper because, um, you know, I don't pretend to know it all. Some people know more than uh, I do on some particular topics. And I worked with a colleague who, who's a long-standing HR career. We both have, actually, mm -hmm. um, to make sure it's as good as it can be. Yeah. Um, and this particular advice piece talks to uh, school leaders about this particular approach. And I can tell you very confidently that those that have uh, used this approach uh, have come back to us and reported very, very positive results. Good. 
Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've, that's why we've called it the tactical approach. Mm -hmm. um, not informal, not formal, it's tactical. Um, in fact, I had a chair of governors uh, contact me not that long ago um, and say that he would like to remind a school leader about their um, stance of conduct. Right. Uh, uh, funny enough, it was during the last World Cup. Oh, really? Talking about something that's very topical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he'd um, he'd been seen acting rather boisterously at the local pub. Oh, I see. Um, and it had been caught on social media. Uh, and it, it it was quite a, a you know it was amusing in in many respects, but it couldn't go unchecked. No, quite. Um, and so what I provided to the chair of governors was this very approach. Okay. Um, and if we could, sorry, Andrew, could I ask you just to scroll back down again, just to sort of yeah, of course, um, so we can see just the beginnings of the letter. Oh yes, of um, course, yeah, yeah. So this is a letter you can you can highlight and save. Um, it's the model. Anything in yellow is adjustable. Yeah, you, know, you can adjust. Um, this is how you would frame the letter. It's very simple, very straightforward. You wouldn't have a list of um, indiscretions. You'd hopefully have one uh, indiscretion. You might have two or three that are related. And there's just some examples there of what, what you might include yeah. uh, in those. And, um, you know, it, it's th these are all real examples, by the way, completely anonymized, but they are actually real examples uh, of teachers and school leaders um, no one's immune um, from being included in this advice, um, uh, but obviously that it's completely anonymized. But you can see that um, we've put one or two uh, examples there uh, of of people who have perhaps behaved uh, indiscreetly on a on a on a, a an occasion, um, and these are the letters that you might want to produce. So once you've given them the um, you can then go into uh, why uh, this this text is again can all be copied and pasted. All the work's done for you. Uh, all you have to change are the bits in yellow. Um, and the beauty of these, Andrew, is that they can be kept on file. There's nothing to stop you. So the, these share many of the many of the um, features of a a formal procedure. Um, I there's a, a standard for improvement. Yep. There's a time scale over which people will be expected to improve. Mm -hmm. um, there's no sanction because it's not a formal procedure. Um, but it's a, if you like, it's a sort of shot across the bows. Um, and if you scroll right down to the bottom of that particular, you can see there's a bit there that they sign. So I would sign, I Guy Dudley, I'm signing this letter to confirm that I have read, understood, and accept this management standard letter with a signature and a date. And that way you've created a very credible, legitimate, auditable, which is very important if you're covering your back, um, approach that you've taken that you can use in in subsequent performance management meetings or one to ones or any narrative, um, and I think you know this is this is something that I, I would really uh, encourage more people to do. It's terrific. Um, and I think you know one of the things that I would one of the questions that I maybe on people's lips is. If someone left and they were they had an active management standard setting letter, would I declare it in the same way that I might declare had they been subject to a disciplinary procedure? Mm. Um, the answer is no. Mm. So you're not, you haven't crossed that threshold yep. of formal action. Yeah, this is in that no man's land. It's not informal. It's gone beyond informal, but it's because it's not formal you would you would not declare it in any given reference right. uh, that you had to provide in the future. It was a really good question. Yeah. 
um, and one that I thought I'd just sort of uh, forewarn people uh, yeah. about. Um, is it is it something you've you've come across in your career, Andrew, as a school several leader? Times. Oh, several times, several times. I've done uh, similar sort of letters. I think this is a really nicely written one, a nicely shaped one, and I, for one, will be downloading it because it's going to save a lot of time. But in uh, in several cases, I can think of in the last two years, it's um, it's a, it's avoided a, a more formal, you know, more formal yeah. proceedings, which I think, quite honestly, was was good for both of us, really. Yeah. Both myself as a school leader and, and the person concerned, really. It wasn't that we were trying to cut corners or shortcuts or not do things properly or professionally, rather of co quite the contrary. But I think it, it um I think it was better for both sides actually. Um I've done a several several of these. Yeah. <laughs> and it's often um I mean it's often used by school leaders for teachers and support staff, but it's often good to Sort of occasionally nip things in the bud if people are at the early stages of their career yeah. and they just need a gentle reminder yeah. of those standards um or it may be someone yeah. who's been around an awful long time who's perhaps sort of you know become a little casual towards the standards and and don't think that they apply to them um because their their level of service has made them immune well it hasn't <laughs> in well, some respects it's, respect. it's that for colleagues who have, um, I'm not talking about this school at all, actually, but for those colleagues who have had 25 years experience and each year has been sort of, you know, incremental and progressive and so forth, then that perhaps is true. But those who've had one year 25 times, they might still, and we do know there is a difference, they might perhaps still um, still think that um, the policies and procedures and so forth are relevant, uh, are still in that first year that they've repeated 25 times, if you see what I mean. So you get in. We used to call this management instruction letters. Is there a reason yes. why it's changed? It's but does it not, not matter? really? I mean, I, th I think it's it's preference. It's I mean, we're, yeah. I've heard them call management instruction. Okay. I tend to avoid the word instruction. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Only because it sort of a, it, it personalizes it in some yeah. respects. Uh, management advice is is sort of again, it's very much sort of you know master and servant type of language. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I think professional stat, or oh, it could be called professional standard setting letter. Yeah. It, it effectively what it does, it depersonalizes it into this letter is about professional standards. I just happen to be giving it to you as your line manager or your school leader, but actually it's a professional standard setting letter. I agree. Uh, whereas management advice and management, it, it, it sort of confers some sort of hierarchical. Uh, and in this very okay. sensitive world we operate in. It's almost sort of, you know, it is in my view that, you know, it's my yes. view, and that's not what I mean. That's not no. what we mean. And it's I a helpful guess. point you've made because it goes back to your professional responsibilities as a school leader yeah. is to uphold the professional standards. So it is. all you're doing is upholding them. Yeah. Um, and the tools that you have to play with are a word in your shell like the professional standard setting letter um or the disciplinary procedure but i think if i prefer to take management advice and management instruction away from that um in fact i quite like professional standard setting letter yeah maybe um, yeah but but it's really it's up to schools this is a the key word in that piece of advice is model yeah. it's up to schools to determine what fits their setting best um they can take advice from their human resources team yep. um and you know i think the input, the thing the, the real clear message i'd like to get across today is i think schools should use it it does avoid that formal procedure which generally avoids a sickness absence and it's it's probably going through an employment procedure for a school leader is the last thing they want at the moment um when they're trying to sort of you know create a sort of normality again that's right um yeah, and i know right. most school leaders are still trying to do that and and you know hats off to them every single one of them um but i think we'll 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 sort of i think it's something that will take on more and more popularity once people see it use it once and you'll probably never go back um avoid the procedure because 
that will be the sort of uh, that will be the thing that sort of gets in the way of you achieving what you want to achieve as a school leader and why you came into the profession. Could I just ask a quick question, Guy? Um, if we place this in the context less of conduct but more of teaching and learning, teaching yeah. performance, is does it still have a relevance there, or is that necessarily going to always go straight to formal or informal review and support plan? Yeah, I mean, in some respects, it is the support plan, isn't it, for uh, yeah. capability? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Again, you could, if we if we called this a professional standard setting letter, the professional standards, if you know, is is separated as you know into two parts. Right. Uh, part A is about the professional practice of teaching, um, and part B is about personal behaviour, professional behaviour. Um, but part B sort of squeezed in at the end uh, of what I sort of look at the teacher stand. And 80% of the teacher standards are about teaching practice. And I think you, you've you hit a good, um, you know, nail on the head there where you could apply this to capability. Mm. Um, and instead of a support plan, you could use it in lieu uh, of a support plan. I guess the support plan suggests that there is a a level of support that you're going to front load to a particular individual who's perhaps not performing as well as they could. Whereas this is sort of we've spotted something, we need to remind you of the procedure. But I think the short answer is to your question is yes, this could have equal application to for capability. I think as it could do the conduct. And the difference, perhaps, for me at least, if you were to place this into in the context of capability and teaching performance as opposed to conduct, is that the former, where one has concerns as a result of doing lesson observations, book scrutinies, and, and what have you, perhaps might sometimes be to <clears throat> be be caused by a, um, <clears throat> a lack of <clears throat> a lack of knowledge, a lack of um, yep. a lack of a lack of skill, and yeah. so forth. The latter almost seems to imply. So, something more deliberate than that, not necessarily an, 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 an unconscious lack of skill, but actually, no, you, you know that this is the system, you know that this is how we behave, and and you've and you've gone and done this regardless. If you see what it's I mean, a bit, yeah, there's a willfulness. Willfulness. That's the word I'm looking for. It seems a little bit more willful than um, <laughs> um, perhaps not. Not perhaps your your either your behaviour management or your your assessment or your differentiation tailored teaching isn't up to scratch. I'm not sure that that yeah. warrants a management instruction letter. Do you see what I mean? No, no, yeah. and I think that's why calling it a professional standards yeah. setting letter. Yeah, you you could, I think, equally apply it to to the teaching standards, the professional standards of teaching. Yeah. Uh, part of some of which are capability related, and some of which are conduct yeah. related. Conduct related, exactly right. Um, yeah. yeah. Do we? I I saw one or two things, but I was talking as I normally do. Um, <laughs> I saw one or two things pop up in the frustratingly when i put my little cursor up at the very top and expect the little tools bar to come down it doesn't which is totally oh. frustrating today so if I'll you see if any can... guy, do share them i'm so sorry having a bit of trouble yeah. on the laptop today i've got a <laughs> i've got a couple of questions here um one from alexandra what if a <clears> member <throat> of staff refuses to, to sign it or avoids signing yeah. it uh, and the same question really from stephanie what if, what if the person declines to sign? Mm. Um, well, <laughs> there's there's a that's a they're very good questions, and I have got an answer. I'll just just get rid of that on my screen because it's a wee bit distracting. Yeah, I mean, if if a, a member um, decides ultimately not to, to sign it, um, I think you're for, you've got two port, you've got two actions. I think the first thing to do is ask them why. Um, because they're signing to say they've read it, they've understood it, and they accept it. So which of those are they not agreeing with? Um, is it the understanding or is it the acceptance? Yep. So I think just qualify that little yep. piece because yep. you could probably resolve it at that point. Yep. And secondly, if um, if they refuse to sign it, it's a little bit like most things in life. You'll say, well... Uh, this will be held on file uh, just because you don't agree with it uh, doesn't undermine its legitimacy 
uh, as a as a tool of management um and therefore it stands uh unless you want to take out a grievance you know it would be the automatic case where somebody took out a grievance against the action of a uh, or decision of management yeah. um but i think I, I, and you know i've covered this in other webinars where people say well, what's the difference if between one and the other well one is a concern mm. where i'm concerned i'm not saying it because i'm concerned about um we'll just unpick the concern and then hopefully they'll sign it if it's i don't agree with the action the outcome well then they have the opportunity to raise a grievance um and i think it's ultimately up to you as a school leader to say your options either are not to sign it and for us to carry on uh, and it will continue to be a legitimate management tool and instruction um or um, which is why it often came that back to management instruction letter um, or um, you can raise a grievance if you don't agree with the uh, don't agree with it but I think this is where your evidence comes in if you've got evidence to suggest or not suggest because evidence is evidence uh, evidence should, should prove uh, beyond all reasonable doubt that um, there has been a shortfall in conduct and as long as you can provide that evidence, you can say, well, what what actually is your objection? I'm being fair. I could have invoked the disciplinary procedure. I chose not to because I want us to be I want us to be collegiate. And but your your conduct has gone beyond what I consider to be uh, the informal stage. Um, but but I want to give us both the opportunity to 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 look upon this favorably and therefore i've decided i've made the professional judgment uh, to invoke this approach um, because your conduct has left me with no alternative again i push the blame back onto them to say i'm the head teacher or i'm the school leader i'm responsible for upholding professional standards you've fallen short of those standards and if i didn't take this action i'd be failing in my duty yeah, as a school leader right. so actually if we just sign this away um we're both fulfilling our responsibilities you as a qts or someone that's held responsible uh, held to account for your conduct against a set of professional standards and me as a school leader being held to account under section seven uh, as someone who's responsible for managing conduct within this school um it's a win-win situation i know some of that will re re rely on charm and good you know, back to your goodwill at the, yeah. at, the, at the beginning but i think it's a case of saying well the evidence is irrefutable yeah. as a school leader i'm responsible i could have have had taken three approaches explain yeah. the approaches yeah be honest with them and say i could have had a word in your ear but this has gone beyond that um i've exercised my professional judgment and i'm actually choosing to go for the lighter touch because it's your first offence or it's not that it hasn't brought the school into disrepute that's a mm. good measure actually Andrew a good standard bearer to say if you've brought the school into disrepute you're more likely to go automatically into the formal disciplinary procedure if you haven't but your conduct's been bad you're more likely to fall into the management standard setting letter um but that, that's all uh within our um advice uh, on the hub on these wider advice pieces but really good questions um thank you uh both of you and um i hope i've answered it brilliantly yeah as always i'm gonna i'm gonna download that letter tonight actually because i'm lucky i have access to do that and i can uh from the uh from the pathway website so the um if, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to show while we're on that one. We've said there are 12 tiles. We all know that HR is going to be packed to the Guinness. <laughs> um, but there's an awful lot of other things on there as well, of course, that we always talk about during these webinars. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and one perhaps we don't raise enough, and I'll just mention it very quickly, is the newsletter. Yeah. Um, some people have, have said, you know, there, there perhaps isn't enough uh, material uh we produce uh on special schools mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah. Or school yeah. business leaders or some of these other areas that aren't perhaps uh, traditionally associated with um, mainstream teaching. Sure. Um, but we do cover a lot of these in our newsletters, uh, including a, a send summary. Uh, and you can see some of the things that we've covered, uh, the revised officer handbooks, uh, for example, key stage one and uh, two announcements, exam timetables, and lots of business as usual. And one of those is is on on school business leader pay. Um, so lots of stuff that we don't cover or can't cover uh, in the traditional advice tiles are covered, I think, more than adequately. Uh, and next, the next newsletter 15 will have a, a, a send uh, spotlight right. um, from Rona Tut, um, our, who's, who's nationally known in send circles. Um, so, yeah, I would I would really uh, encourage people to have a look at all of the advice tiles, including uh, the newsletters, which uh, uh, have got some really helpful tips and but yes, you can see there, um, we've we've covered an awful lot, um, and these have just been audited, as Andrew will know, because I'm bombarding him with uh, <laughs> advice pieces yeah, that have been audited. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. Thank you, as always, Guy. That was absolutely comprehensive and really, really helpful tonight. Well, it always is. It always is, but especially. Oh, uh, on on this particular um, topic, which um, like an awful lot of school leaders on this call, I'm sure, um, can be extremely time consuming, and sometimes it almost feels that it doesn't even have a purpose sometimes. And you can avoid that uh, with those uh, formal and tactical approaches, informal and tactical approaches first, um, which are very human. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was, that was terrific, as always. As always. So we're um, we're going to uh, we're going to close that one for now. We've got another webinar, I think, soon um, next month. Actually, before uh, before Christmas, before the end of term, as Guy goes off, we thank him as always for his brilliant advice, explained so simply for us. Weary, well, I say for us weary school leaders. Maybe, maybe that's unfair, but certainly I feel tired. <laughs> um, nice and simply. <laughs> Whenever I um. I'm sorry, you're on mute. Oh, I can say it back at you. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I was only saying, <laughs> if I can understand it, anyone yeah, can. Yeah, exactly right. But to be, to, be, to be serious for a moment, you, you have always said in the, uh, in the long time that I've known you now that um, it is, for you, it's very much about enabling school leaders to stay in control. Uh, it really is. And to be able to make decisions, because I think in this job, uh, certainly for me at least, and maybe I'm not speaking for everybody, but sometimes you can quite quickly fall into sort of a state of paralysis. Uh, yes. and maybe that's through fear or through, do you know what I'm doing the wrong thing? Um, am I, you know, and the self doubt that comes so easily comes with this job. <laughs> uh, and you, you manage to banish that for us every time we speak to you. So my you. pleasure. Brilliant. Brilliant. Right. So hopefully we'll, um, if you want to find out any more, uh, then you know where to go. As always, that's the that's the that's the website. Please do uh, click on that. Uh, go to that, and you'll find out uh, much much more about this brilliant program. And we will hopefully see you again very very soon. I look forward to it uh, for the next webinar. Until then, I hope you uh, I hope you manage to get home at some stage and uh, and manage to switch off at some stage this evening. One more day, and it's the weekend. Okay, take care. Thanks for joining.